If you have your MMDs, your muted mobile devices, uh, I'm not looking at you. I'm <laughs> <laughs> then uh, type in Luke chapter 8 verse, verse uh, 26 I, I really enjoy you doing that you can do the Greek and the Hebrew in your iPads, iPhones, Androids whatever the device that you might have I love it and also there's the Wi-Fi if you see LifeGate guest you can just jump on there if you need a Wi-Fi do some Twitter and about church and some Facebook about church it would be real good why are, you, why are you right here in church also if you have your Bibles uh don't mute them, but turn to Luke chapter 8 and verse 26. And while you're doing that, I'm going to ask a few questions. What do people that you know, your friends, your people you work with, people you run with, family, associations, and members, what do they think about demons and devils? And what do they think about Satan and satanic issues? What? Evil spirits, what, what are they? Do they ever discuss those things with you? Do you ever discuss them with them? What about our world leaders? You know, our educated elect. What do they think about Satan and the devil and evil spirits and those kinds of things? You never hear them talk about it. Um, what do they think? Do, what do they think about somebody like me who knows those things are real? Do they think that I'm just this uneducated idiot that, you know, who, who, who has to uh, figure this stuff out or blame stuff that happens on that, that I have this little fantasy thing? Is that what they think? You know, and there are some people that um, really believe that Satan and the devil is real. But, but they think he's like this cosmic prankster. He's just playing jokes on everybody. He, uh, you know, he's, he's real. But you don't take him serious. You know, he's like, where's his little dunce hat or something? You know, that's kind of the idea that a lot of folk have of him. You don't take him very serious. Yeah, he's real, but, you know, he's not going to mess with me. <laughs> I, I, and maybe the main question I could ask you is, what do you think about it? What are your thoughts? If I were to get you to write on a piece of paper what you believed about the devil, about demons, about Satan, about evil spirits, what is your knowledge base? What do you think? What position are you in concerning those things? What is the Bible position? The Bible's position is that these are very real entities. These are things that we really need to understand and be serious about because they cause humanity a lot of problems. This is the Bible position. Every race, every creed, every color, every language, every person at some point in time is going to be face to face with demonic activity. What do you do with that? And the Bible is filled with it. You can't read the Bible without running into this evil presence. From the beginning in Genesis all the way to the end in Revelation, you have all of these issues that are going on here with this evil presence. But yet as much as and as big an issue as this is, it's amazing to me that People discuss it or talk about it so little. Our world leaders hardly ever talk about it. Our spiritual leaders hardly ever talk about it or discuss it, right? And we hardly ever talk about it or discuss it. So we're going to be looking at this again today and right where we're at. So if you recall, Jesus had gotten in the sailboat and he said, we're going to the other side. And he found him a pillow and he curled up and he took him a nap. And out there, <laughs> crossing over, uh, this storm, it said, it was a squall, and it said it came down on them. It attacked them. We talked about this last time. And these guys thought they were going to drown. Jesus gets up. He, they wake him. He gets up, and he speaks to it, and he says, shut up, hush, be still, peace, be still. And it did. It laid down flat. Well, this has happened. So they finally get to the other side to find out they're really on the other side. I mean, they are on the other side of humanity. They have crossed over to a land of devils, a land of demons. They come ashore. So this is where we pick up our reading today in our study of Luke, chapter 8, verse 26. It says, they sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, 
which is across the lake from Galilee. And when Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by, now that's very important, he was met by a demon-possessed man. He didn't have an evil spirit. This guy is demon-possessed. A demon-possessed man from the town. And for a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. Now, this, this region of Gerasenes, this region here is uh, not visited by the Jews in the days of Jesus. Um, you just didn't go there. It was the land of Satan is how they referred to it. And that's not where you wanted to go. It was demonically influenced. And you know how it is sometimes when you, especially if you've ever been overseas, you'll go to some places overseas and there's this demonic presence. And, and some places are just like that. Well, that's how this was. It's called the Decapolis. Uh, there were 10 areas there. Right now, today, it's Syria. And then, of course, next to Syria, you have Iran. And then next to Iran, you have, no, next to, uh, to Syria, you have Iraq. Wait a minute. I have, you have, yeah, Iraq. And then you have Iran. So it's still having a hard time, Right? I mean, we, we can still see this happening today. And we're going to see some things as we go through this, what's really happening. And what, what's interesting is this is where Mary Magdalene, remember her? Mary Magdalene had seven devils that Jesus delivered her from. Seven devils. She came not very far from here. Magdala is where she was from. It wasn't her name. They just called her Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene. And, and she came from this area, and she had seven, seven devils. So this is what's happening here. This is this influence as Jesus steps out into this place. So I want you to see it. You know, as soon as Jesus steps out of the boat and steps on shore, here is this monster man who jumps out. You know, he comes to meet Jesus, it says. And I, I really want us to see that how important that this guy came to meet Jesus because this guy is possessed. I mean, why did he come to meet Jesus? Why didn't he run? Why didn't, he, why didn't he get out of there? I, I really think, and as I go through this, I think you'll see it too, that this guy wanted help. And, and he was fighting with himself, but he got there. And I want us to see this as we're going through it. But this guy's kind of legendary. He says that he has done this for a long time. He'd lived in the cemeteries. He had this, this fetish with dead, with death and, and tombs. And this guy is in bad, bad shape. And I want you to think about it. You know, his hair's all wild and woolly and, and his eyes are all rolled back in his head. And, and, you know, and he stinks and he's nasty and he's dirty and he's naked. Now, the last thing a guy, at least this guy, wants to see on a beach is a naked guy. I don't want to see a naked guy on the beach. That's just the rule. That's just the rule. Get out of here. <laughs> so imagine this. You know, you've just been through this storm, and you thought you were going to drown. You're still wet. Your clothes are still wet. And you step out of the boat, and here comes this monster man coming up to Jesus yelling at the top of his voice, and he's, and he's nasty and he's dirty. <laughs> and, and you're, what is this? What do you do? What do you do when something like that happens? I know what I think I do. Don't look at him. Just move on. Just don't give him any attention. Don't talk to him. Don't encourage him. Just go on. Maybe he'll leave. And I'd probably say, let's get back in the boat. There's another place <laughs> down here. Let's get out of here. That's not what Jesus did. And that's not what he wants us to do. But what would you really do if that were to happen to you? What happens? How do we respond in, in, those, in those situations? Perhaps something like that has happened to you. Someplace in life you did meet somebody like that. What did you do? In churches today, we have two basic thoughts, trains of thoughts that we go with. It's a pendulum thing. And this one train of thought is demons and devils and all that stuff. It's just premise. Uh, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? <laughs> primitive. Or just primitive uh, ideas and idealisms that are way over here. You know, they really don't mean anything. They're just uneducated people trying to find a way to explain things. And they're, they're just not real today. Educated people are above that kind of thing. And then you have this other area where the pendulum swings back over to this other side where, you know, uh, it, 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 it's so real that everything's a demon. Over here, they're thinking it's all mental dementia. But over here, you know, it, everything's really a demon and spiritual and, and all sicknesses and everything's of the devil and, you know, and all that kind of thing. Well, when you're over here on this side, you know, you, you, really, have, you really have to see that 
the darkness has little, if any, influence on real life. But when you're over here at the, at the other end of the dimension, uh, of the other end of the spectrum thing, then what you're what you're really looking at over here is that everything's a devil. Well, where is Jesus in this? Where is his position? Where is your position? How do you align? What do you think? See, I kind of see Jesus in the center, just ministering whichever way he needed to go. Everything wasn't a demon, but some things were. You know? so, so he ministers here. I mean, you know, I'm thinking about this. When you think about Jesus and, and his ministry, um, was he just trying to trick us? Was he pretending he was delivering people when all the time he was healing them of mental illnesses? Or were they real? And if they were real, where did they go? <laughs> so, so this is kind of the thought that I'm wanting to, to get here. Uh, Delbert, why in the world are you talking about this? Well, listen, let me tell you something. I don't want to. I don't like talking about this. This is my least favorite topic to discuss and talk about. But obviously, Jesus wants us to talk about it. Obviously, Father God wants us to talk about it. Obviously, the Holy Spirit wants us to talk about it. And I've learned over my years of ministry that when I preach on things, somebody here or somebody that you know needs this. I'm not saying somebody here is demon-possessed. That's not what I'm saying. But maybe you know somebody that is, or maybe there are some things inside of you that are controlling you or possessing you. So I've just learned that over the years that I've ministered that, that when you come to these places, and especially like doing a series like we're doing where I don't get to pick and choose what I preach, this is just where we are, and it's the time Jesus wanted us to preach it. So I know how this works out in our lives. So what I want to do today is look at this, and I want to look at this guy, and I want to use him, as it were, as a, as a template. I want us to look at this because this is one of the most unique, most unique demon possessions that we will find and read about in the Scriptures. It's unlike anything else that Jesus ever dealt with. All the other possessions and aspects of demon possessions where he cast out a spirit, they just left immediately. But this one didn't. And we can, we can take him and do a template with him. You and I are going to be better prepared and to handle anything that we meet. Because the truth is that one day you're going to step into a situation where you're going to meet a demon. So let's learn something from this, okay? So what I want to do is I want to look at some aspects of him. I want to read verses 27 and verse, some of verse 27 and some of verse 29 and just draw some things out specifically about this guy. It says, for a long time, this man had not worn clothes. So he was kind of this, had this exhibitionist disorder, probably some morality problems that he was facing. Or he, neither had he lived in a house, but he'd lived in the tomb. So there's another disorder, you know, a fixation with death and dead people. He lived as an exclusionist. He separated himself from people. And then in verse 29 we read, many times it, I want you to see that, it's a it. It's not a he or a she. It's a it. It had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, which is telling us this is their way of rehab, you know, they would lock him away and put him under guard. Today is what we would do and rehab him, but they would chain him. And there's really an attempt to help him. They're trying to keep the guy from destroying himself. So they, and he, but he would break the chains. He had broken his chains and, and had been driven by the demon into the solitary places. So we're, we're starting to see all these disorders that this guy's got. Mark's gospel adds more disorders that this guy's facing and has. In Mark's gospel, in 5.5, 5, it, it, it tells us that, that this guy would scream and yell day and night. So, you know, what, what do we see here, kind of, that we can relate to? Because this is what I'm really after is getting us to relate, relate. Is it, you know, is it severe uh, bipolar? Is he, is he facing that? Or maybe severe Tourette's? Is, is that part of it? Uh, maybe severe autism? Is, is that a part of it? Uh, Delbert, are you saying that people have uh, uh, autism or Tourette's or, or, or bipolar? Are you saying they have demons? No, 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 that's not what I'm saying at all. I think you, gotta, you can't go way over here. You, you got you to gotta figure this thing out. What do they need? Is it something that they need to be cured of or is it something they need to be delivered from? So, uh, but it, it's worth, isn't it, a, a prayer? It's, it's worth looking at, right? Well, at least we can pray for them. So, so I think that's what I'm trying to communicate to you. But it also says in Mark's gospel that he cut himself. 
he cut himself with stones and pottery. He would cut himself. And I, I was interested in that because I, in my studies, I found out that people that cut themselves like that aren't suicidal. You would think they would, but they're not suicidal. But people who cut themselves like that, they're having so much torment and pain and stress on the inside is what they're doing is trying to cut themselves to get it out of them. I read the book by Glenn Beck on I Am, I Am George Washington, and I didn't know this. But do you know that they bled George Washington? That's what they used to do then. They would cut them and bleed them to get the, get the sickness out of them. And so what this guy was doing was trying to get this stuff out of him. He, you know, it, it, was, it was a disorder, sure it was, but well, he was trying to get free from this stuff. He came to meet Jesus, and this is what I'm wanting us to see. You know, he didn't run. He came to meet Jesus. He could have ran from Jesus. That's not what he wanted help. So this demonized person shows us exactly what evil and devils and demons and evil spirits want to do to each one of us, every single one of us. They want to terrorize us. They want us to self-destruct. They want us to be immoral. They, they, they want us to be weird people and eventually kill us. And so we kind of see this with this guy. And they took him and they chained him in an attempt to help him so that he wouldn't cut himself. They, they tried to chain him so he wouldn't hurt himself or hurt others or frighten others. And this was a weird guy. It was an attempt to help him, not just to, not just to chain him up. And, and, I, and I see this so much today. See, what they were wanting to do was restrain him. He didn't need restraining he needed restoring. Man can only restrain. Only God can restore. And you take this now and you put it into the religious systems. I was talking to somebody about this yesterday. Listen, what religion tries to do to all of us is restrain us with legalisms and commandments and laws, denominations and those kinds of things. They try to restrain us with this stuff. You got to believe what I believe. You got to think like I think. You can't do this. You can't do that. And so there's all these laws re of restraining us. But when you come to Christ, He doesn't want you to to be restrained like that in religion. He wants you to have a relationship with Him so you can be restored. Religion wants to restrain you. Jesus wants to restore you. Re religion wants to make you religious, and Jesus wants a relation. So, so we got to think on these things because what demons will do to you and your children and your spouse, I mean, uh, to anybody that you know if they have the opportunity, is to do what's happening in some proportion to what's happening to this man. He's really a template for us to learn something. And today, demons attempt don't they, to isolate us. They attempt to do all of these things to each and every one of us. So the solution is restoring, not restraining. So as we look at this in Luke chapter 8, verse 28, now let's read some more and let's get some more info that we can talk about. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet shouting. Get, get the picture of what's going on here. Shouting at the top of his voice. What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. Now, I want you to see this part. Here's what it says. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Now leave that up there until we get it. What is, how does that read to you? What does that mean to you? What it's telling me is that Jesus was telling this thing to come out and this thing wouldn't come out. We're always told, aren't we, that, that Jesus just said it and they just popped out. Not here. And I'll show you in another verse that we're going to read where, where it was, this was a re repetitious thing. This was repetitive. And so this is fascinating. This was fascinating to me. I'm trying to listen, you know, like we've been talking about. I'm trying to understand something here. What's going on? And there's a few points that I want to talk about. First of all, with every single one of us, you know, we have people that we want to minister to. We want to help them. Uh, we, we, we pray for them. We want them delivered. Um, but that maybe they don't get immediately delivered. But we don't give up. We, we stay there. We fight with it. We battle for them. They're important. That's what Jesus would have us do. Don't just quit because we prayed once and it didn't happen. But also in our own lives, right? We go through stuff that we need deliverance from. We have habits. We have addictions. And we fight with it and we want free from it. But maybe we don't get free the first time, second time, third time. Well, listen, be repetitive with it. And if you will, eventually God will deliver you. I promise you. But, but there's more here that I'm seeing as we were looking at this. As I'm looking at this, this thing was talking. It was yelling at the top of its voice. It was shouting. And the way a demon will always, 
always give itself away. Now, this guy, there wasn't too much difficulty in determining that this guy had a demon, right? I mean, he's naked, he's nasty, he's, you know, he's shouting, yelling. So, I mean, but, but if that's not the case, if he's not a possession situation, just an evil spirit in this person's life that you're maybe wanting to handle, how do you know? They're always talking. They're, they give themselves away by making a lot of noise. They're, 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 I mean, you don't hand them a microphone. They're, they're, you don't need to. They're just, oh, they're just yakking all the time. They're loud. I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever heard a demon talk. It's spooky. It's weird. I've heard several. Judy and I, this was years ago, just one of the things I'm going to tell you about. There have been a lot of things, but, but one of the things is we were having a life group. We were, we were at a life group, and uh, the way we do life groups is we'll sit around and we'll discuss perhaps the sermon or whatever. We'll talk. When I go to a life group, I try to set back. I try my best to not become the leader because I'm the pastor, and so everybody you know, kind of aims at me to talk to them and, and, and ask the questions to and all this stuff. Well, I don't want to do that. I want the leader to lead. So we're at this, we're at this life group, and after people have, have talked and shared, then a chair is usually placed in the center of the room. People that need prayer, want prayer, will go and sit in the chair, and then everybody will get around them and pray for them and, and, and pray for their needs and whatever. So this young man had begun coming to the church, and he was at this life group. Well, he wanted to get in the chair. So he, he sat in the chair. And as they began to get around him, this voice came out of him. Now, it was a it was a whiny, effeminate, wimpy little voice. I mean, it was it, it, it was it was nauseating. <laughs> but it wasn't his voice. So the host, the person who owned the house, looks at me. I'm sitting in a chair with my Bible in my lap, look, reading it while they're ministering to him. And she looks at me and she says, what was that? And I just closed my Bible, stood up and said, we have a demon tonight. And we went and we ministered to the, to the young man. We got him set free before he left. He was, he was free and shared some things with us. We saw where the, the stuff had happened and we got to minister to him. Now, Delbert, did that frighten you? No. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world, right? 1 John 4, 4. No, don't. No. But I always invoke the name of Jesus. I bring that name forth. I plead the blood of Jesus, not only me, but everybody there, but, and also the person, most especially the person to whom I'm, we're ministering. So, so this, is, this is what's happening here. This guy is, is yelling, and you got to see this, how it, um, I mean, this is unnerving. You're standing there, and somebody's kneeling at your feet, and they're yelling and screaming at the top of their voice. This is crazy, and this is what's happening here. But I noticed something. In this passage that I had never noticed before, and I've never heard anyone talk about. And that's what, that what it says. Therefore, Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. He had commanded him, meaning he had commanded him, commanded the thing to come out of him, but it hadn't come out. It wouldn't come out. What's going on here? Instead of coming out, what it began doing was stating its case, was arguing why it should be there, why it shouldn't leave, why it's supposed to be there. And this was interesting to me. I mean, it's, it's obvious something is different here because Jesus never debated with a demon. Never, not any other time. But he's debating with this demon. And he, this demon even knew who Jesus was. He says, Jesus, the son of the most high. Even though he knew, and demons have great theology, by the way. Demons believe in tremble. A lot of Christians don't even do that, but, but, but they do. And this, this guy knew, this demon knew exactly who Jesus was, but he wouldn't obey him. What's happening here? What's this about? So I'm, I'm watching this, you know, and it asks a most interesting, a seemingly out of context question this demon did. It said this, what do you want with us? What, what, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? It, it, that's an interesting question. I mean, because it seems to me it's pretty obvious what Jesus wanted, right? Jesus wanted the demon to come out of the guy. I mean, that seems pretty clear to me. Why is it asking that question? <laughs> and, and what do you want with me? I want you to come out of there. That's what I want you to do. <laughs> but he wouldn't come out. So what's going on here? What's happening? So then in verse 30, we read this. Jesus starts a dialogue with the guy. With the thing. He says, Jesus asked him, what is your name? 
Nowhere else in Scripture does Jesus do this. He's dialoguing with the demon. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied. Because many demons had gone into him. And they, now it's not a it, now it's a bunch of them, they begged him, how often? Repeatedly. Do you see this? This wasn't, I mean, this wasn't an easy deliverance here. Even for Jesus. There was a repetition going on. Jesus was telling him to come out, and he was arguing back. Repeatedly. Not to order them to go into the abyss. And then it's in the abyss that we finally are going to get a few answers. But, but again, there's this repetition thing going on. So what's going on? Jesus asked the thing its name. <laughs> that's, that's why, you know? And so let's look at this. Uh, Jesus is getting some information. That's what he's doing. But let's look at this, at this Greek word for, for the name that he gave. He gave the name of legion. There's your Greek. And it means a body of soldiers. A body of what? A body of soldiers whose number differed. In the time of Augustus seems to have consisted of 6,100 foot soldiers and 726 horsemen. This guy has an army in him. This guy is a demon condominium. But what I really want you to hear me say is this, is this guy's a demon barrack. He's a place where demons are camping out. Finally, we get some information. and Jesus gets some information about what's going on here. All right, this guy's got a bunch of demons in him. He's an army of demons is what he is. And, and so we find that, and their argument was they didn't want to go to the abyss, right? So let's look at this Greek word, the abyss. Abyssus means the bottomless, the pit, the immeasurable depth, the abode of demons. And we find this frequently we find this abyss frequently in the book of revelations but it's really all through the bible it's from genesis to revelation that we're going to find this abyss this this bottomless pit thing so uh, what i want to do is just read out some of these that are we find in the book of revelation to you because i know you're familiar with one it's in chapter 20 where the devil is cast into the bottomless pit and changed in the millennia takes place but there's all through. That's not the only time that this has ever happened or the only time it will ever happen. I just want to give you these. In Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1 and 2 and 11. In Revelation chapter 11 verse 7. In Revelation chapter 17 and verse 8. And in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 3. These are times when God is opening and closing this abyss. All through the book of Revelation. And all through the scriptures as you read, you find that God opens and closes this abyss or the depth or the deep, he, he opens and closes it at his will. He uses hell for his will. I want to read this to you. Back in 97, 98, 99, we had a three-year study on the book of Revelation. And I wrote this in The Stone Cometh. So I want to read it to you. It, it's, it's, it'll help us here a little bit. It was from the abyss, or deep. The flood came to destroy the wicked in the days of Noah. I know you know it rained and we had the flood, but what happened also, what that verse says, is the fountains of the deep were broken up. So God opened up the deep to come forth. The abyss of the deep can be opened in Genesis 7, 11, or it can be closed in Genesis 8, 2. In 8, 2, it talks about how God closed the depths. It was from the depths that Pharaoh's army was destroyed. Now, we know that the sea opened up, but as they're praising him in, in, Genesis, in Exodus 15, 5, and 8, it talks about how that the, the depth waters were, the depths were, were congealed. The depths of the abyss is boiling place of Leviathan. It's the boiling place of Leviathan in Job 41, 31. And from the abyss, the beast of Revelation comes. And that's in 11, 7, not 20. So God is opening and God is closing the abyss at his will. And evidently, the demon's argument was, we're not going back to the abyss. The abyss is open right now. It's not time to go back to the abyss. Matthew 8, 29 references that very thought. It says there in Matthew 8, 29, it says, what do you want, us, want with us, son of God? They shouted, have you come here to torture us before 
the appointed time. It's not time to torture us. And then in Mark 5.10, it says this, and he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Oh, I want us to try to get this. You see, as strange as it sounds, now you got to hear me, as strange as it sounds, these demons won the argument with Jesus. He didn't cast them out of the area. He didn't send them back to the abyss. Now, they're coming out of the guy. But he kind of had to deal with them. And this is really strange to me. This is, doesn't fit my theology. <laughs> you know? And so I'm working here. So I'm trying to understand and trying to listen to the Spirit. What's going on here? Why would God now open the abyss? Why is God going to open the abyss at this particular time? Well, we find more demonic activity in the time of Jesus than any other time in all of the scriptures. Before Jesus or after Jesus, we find more demonic activity going on then. And you know what? As I thought about that, as I was seeing, it won't be very long before as we studied in the past, and we'll study some more, but that generation would not pass. We've read, we've read that. We've looked at that. But that generation was not going to pass before hell was loosed on them. They're going to kill the Son of God. They're going to reject him. And in A.D. 70, they're going through some tough times. But to lead up to A.D. 70, the abyss was opened. And these things are coming out. God is going to use hell to bring a judgment upon that religious system. If you, if you want to, look at, look at, look at uh, in the book of Matthew, chapter 12 and verse 45. And I'll tell you there quickly what, what it's talking about. Jesus says, I'm going to liken this generation to a man who has an evil spirit. And he's clean. He's, the devil is, the, 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 the evil spirit is cast out and he's swept and he's cleaned. And the thing comes back and he sees that the house is swept and clean. So he comes back in, but he brings with him what? Seven times, seven more demons more evil than himself. And he says the first state of the man, the last state of the man was worse than the first. So this is what's happening here. It, there's a time, and, and you still look at that area right now. You look at Syria and Iran and Iraq and what's going on over there. They've rejected Jesus, and you've got all this stuff happening, even today. And it's always kind of been that way. So this is what's happening. Let's read verse 32. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into them. And he gave them permission. Now, Jesus has never given the demon permission to do anything. And when the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. So instead of sending them to the abyss, he gives permission for them to go into this herd of pigs. They're coming out of the man, even if it means deviled ham. So, so the pigs ran down the cliff and committed suicide. I was trying to light it up just a little bit. I mean, you know, you're talking about demons. You want to you do something here, right? So, <laughs> they actually ran down the cliff and, and did swine dives. That's what they did. <laughs> boo. Am I getting some booze? Maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Why did Jesus allow that to happen? What's, what's going on here? Why did he, well, there's a couple of thoughts. One thing is you couldn't doubt something happened, could you? I mean, I mean uh, nobody would doubt that this guy, the man, something big took place here. Pretty dramatic thing. And I think it's Mark that talks about 2,000 pigs ran off a cliff. That's a bunch of demons you know, going in there. But it also shows us what, what they want to do to us. What, 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 what darkness and, and evil wants to do to each and every one of us. They want to destroy our lives. They want us to self-destruct, cut ourselves, to, cut our lives to pieces. They want us to, to, to exclude ourselves from people that can really help us. And, and, and they want us to be immoral. Verse 34. When those tended the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. Now, this obviously was happening really quickly. They were running around telling people what was happening, and people were starting to come pretty immediately. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out sitting at Jesus' feet. He's not screaming now. He's not yelling. 
and he's dressed. He's not naked, and he's in his right mind. Hallelujah. And they were afraid. What? Now they're afraid? I'm thinking, why are they afraid now? I'm going to tell you. They were afraid. And then those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Had been what? Cured. I think, I don't want to try to explain this. You know, we look at deliverance as such a negative bad thing. But man, if I got one in me, I want him out. I don't know about you. I want to be cured from that thing. I, you know, we have all been, all of us who are Christ followers have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. It says we've been delivered. So there's a deliverance service going on in each one of us all the time, every day. And deliverance is not a bad thing. Deliverance is a great thing. And Jesus is the answer to that. And it's amazing. You know, they're, they're afraid now. But what we see here is a restored person, not a restrained person. We see somebody who's come to Christ, who's met him. And isn't that what we each should desire? I do. Man, I want to sit at Jesus' feet. I want to, I want to be clothed in his righteousness. I want to be in my right mind. I don't want to have evil, wicked thoughts going on in my head all the time. I don't want to battle with this stuff. I don't want to battle with addictions and, and habits and things that are destroying me. I want to get free from that. And this is what Jesus wants to do for every single person that will just come and meet him. That will just come and give him an opportunity to do it. And it says he was cured. Let's look at that word. It's the Greek word sozo. What it means is to be saved. What it, that's what it means. Sozo. It means to, to save, rescue from danger or destruction, to save from the evils which obstruct uh, the reception of the messianic deliverance. Man, that's what we all want to be saved, right? We all want this. That's what every single Christ follower should need and should want. He didn't need restraining. He didn't need religion. What he needed was a relationship with Jesus, and he needed to be restored. Jesus didn't leave the poor man to Satan. He just didn't turn his back on him, do what probably most of us would have done. Don't look at him. Don't talk to him. Let's avoid him. Maybe he'll go away. He didn't do that. He stood there and let this guy scream and yell until he was able to help the guy. He argued with the thing that was coming out of him. He didn't give up on the guy. This was repetitious as we've seen. I like that. In verse 37, it says this, Then all the people, how many of them? All the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them. What? Oh, come on. Why? Because they were overcome with fear. That's the same Greek word that we read previously where they were afraid. It's the same Greek word. This is mentioned it, it, it twice. They were overcome with fear. So he got in the boat and what did he do? He sailed away. I want, to, I want us to all hear this. Is that he, he won't force himself on any of us. He will sail away. And leave you with your pigs. He will sell away. And Jesus wants to help us. That's what he's here for. That's why he came to help us. So, as we see this, this let's look at this word afraid, or, or that was translated in the verse we just read, overcome with fear. It's the Greek word phobia. We get, our, of course, our word phobia from it. People have phobias. They have fears of this thing or that thing. And that's what we're talking about here. It's to be struck with fear. It's to be seized with alarm of those startled by strange sights or occurrences. We say this all through scriptures where people have, are, have a fear of God. We're sinful. And in the presence of God, people will just fall out. It's the fear of God that knocks them down. It's not somebody pushing them down. They just fall out because the presence of God is there. People have phobias of Jesus. This is what they were afraid of. They'd had the demons there for a long time. They were afraid of Jesus. Had a phobia of him. Lost people want Jesus to go away. Leave them. I always do. Each and every one of us was probably like that one time. We'd, we'd rather have demons than be delivered. People would rather Jesus go away than mess, mess with their piggy banks. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about things that we consider so precious in our lives that we want to hold on to it more than we want to 
have Jesus present in our lives. We don't want him messing with that stuff. We have a phobia that he will. There are countries today that I've been to, Haiti and, and these places that we've talked about earlier, where they don't want Jesus there. They'd rather have their pigs. They'd rather have their demons than have Jesus. And though people know their lives would be so much better if Jesus were to stay, they still send him away. Some would rather have their monsters and their maniac ways than have the presence of Jesus in their lives. People re prefer a maniac rather than a Christian. And you know people like that. People r rather be terrified by Satan than terrified by Jesus. They prefer demonic activity more than the Holy Spirit's activity in their lives. People are more comfortable with pigs and monsters than with Father God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus. How about you? Where do you align here? Are you saying, leave me, leave me alone? See, are you thinking right now, I'd be glad when this is over. I want to get out of here. He will. He'll just leave you. I pray that's not the case. I pray you want his presence in your life. Verse 38. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. How much who? God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Now, of course, Luke's inference here is that Jesus is, of course, God. Man made flesh. God come in human form. The center of the Trinity, the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. He's the fullness of the Godhead for us. He told a guy, go back to town. He wanted to go with Jesus. Who would want to stay there? Nobody would want to stay there, but he, he didn't want to stay there. He wanted to go with Jesus, but Jesus says, no, your place is here. I want to ask you, where is your place? Where is your place? Um, see, a lot of times it's easier just to sail away, just to get out of there, than, than, than stay where God wants us to be. A lot of times it'd be a lot easier just to kind of start over. But that's not what he tells us to do, none of us to do. He, he wants us to stay because our staying is the platform or the springboard into what we can say to people because people remember our pigs. And they can tell Jesus to leave. They can't tell you to leave. You're going to work tomorrow. It's your job. They can tell Jesus to leave, but they can't tell you to leave. You're in your family. That's your family. Your family can't tell you to leave. They can tell Jesus to leave. They can't tell you to leave. Whoever that you're around, they can tell Jesus to leave. But they remember your pigs. They remember how you used to be. And you can use that as a platform because they'll never forget the chains that had you bound and how you used to cut your life to pieces. Where's your place? Do you remember the first person or maybe some of the first people that you ever told that you were a Christian? Do you, ever, do you remember any of those people? I do. I, I, I remember one of the first person, pe pe people that I told that I was a Christian. He said, and, and he know me, knew me for a, since I was this, in the seventh grade. He sat by, right behind me in, in homeroom. And he knew me. And I told him I was a Christian. We were neighbors. Um, our kids played together. We did sports together. <laughs> and I told him I was a Christian. And he laughed. And he said, that's not going to last. We'll see. Well, six months later, it was still lasting. And his wife said to us, don't forget about your friends because what we had to do, we, we, we wanted, we were around them, we were ministered to them, we wanted them to go to church, but they would not, so we needed to get some different influences in our life. And so we kind of changed friends. We still ministered to them, invited them to come to everything that we possibly could, but they wouldn't. It was about a couple of years ago. His, I got a phone call from my sister who's still her, his neighbor and, and told me that his daughter had died. His daughter's my daughter's age. And it was a tragic death. She was on a, surge, she was on a, 
on a table having surgery and they lost her and it is broken and I called him and I said man I heard about Lynn I said I'm so sorry and he's broken he was crying broken man I said can I pray for you can I pray with you he said please do he said all these years he's been watching all these years he's been keeping up with me all these years to see if it's really going to last I prayed with him what I've learned over all, these, all this time is the people that have watched me, they could get rid of Jesus. They could tell Jesus to leave. But I was in their lives. Even though I lived in a different town, they knew what I was doing. And every time I got a chance, I'd see them. So I want, to, I want you to know, somebody's watching you. Somebody's keeping up with you. Where is your place? They can tell Jesus to leave, but they can't tell you to leave. Your platform is right here right now, at work tomorrow, at, in your family, around your friends. Tell them. You know, people with uh, monstrosities called lives, monster people, you know people like that. They're destructive, they're destroying their own lives, cutting their own lives to pieces. You know people. I do too. What are you doing for them? What are you doing? Doing anything? What can you do for them? The one thing Jesus doesn't want us to do is just turn our face and walk away from them. That's not what he wants us to do. He wants us to try to minister to them and love them, get them cured. But maybe you, in your life, your life is a monster. Maybe in your life, you have things possessing you, habits, addictions, that need to get out. You're cutting your life to pieces these kinds of things maybe you need prayer and if you do don't go without it and the way I'm going to close today is just telling you listen I don't want to make a spectacle of anyone so we're not going to go through a deliverance service here <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but you know my number you know my email address get in touch with me get in touch with some leaders here don't leave here today if you feel it that impressive don't leave here today. I've already told our, our eldership what we will be talking about. If you need prayer today before you leave, I promise you we'll take you to some place and we'll pray for you. We'll, we'll, we'll minister to you best we possibly can. But please, please, please get prayer. Meet Jesus. And if you will, he'll help you just like he helped this guy. This guy seemed so helpless, but Jesus restored him. You've tried to restrain yourself. If you'll meet Jesus, he'll restore you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord God, that uh, uh, you show us the reality of darkness and evil. So, Father, I ask you today as we've come and each of us have our own struggles in our own times, I ask you to bless us and give us wisdom and guidance and deliverance so that we can have a restoration. Tra deliver us from the kingdom of darkness. Translate us into the kingdom of your dear son. Let us live for you a restored life with a relationship. Head still bowed and your eyes closed. Just nobody looking but me. How many of you know you're not where you need to be with God? I'm not talking about demon possession. I am just talking about you are not where you need to be with the Lord. Maybe you've met him at some point in time in your life, but you've slid back. Or maybe, you know, you're just not where you want to be with him. You, you maybe never met him, but you want to. So if that's you with me only looking, and I want to pray for you. I just want to pray a blessing. I'm not going to have you come down here do anything like that. Just want, to, just want to bless you. Just want to pray for you right where you're sitting. If that's you, would you right where you're sitting slip your hand up and say, pray for me. Pray for me. I see a hand in the middle. A hand over here on the right. Back there on the left. I see you. Anything else? Anything else? I see your hands. Father, we ask you just to bless these people, Lord. Help them.